Hey guys, let's talk about the respiratory system. So this is giving you a really nice overview of the entire respiratory system and pretty much everything that's involved. We could just about do this entire lecture from this slide alone. But I'm not going to do the whole lecture from this slide, so let's just run through everything briefly and then we'll go through bit by bit and talk about it in more detail. So the upper respiratory tract versus lower respiratory tract, this is very important to think about. So you've heard about people getting upper respiratory or lower respiratory infections. This is what they're talking about. So the upper respiratory tract is the nasal cavities up top. Uh, the pharynx is back in here. There are three parts, uh, top and then, well, let's not get into the names. Uh, the glottis, which is here, and then the larynx, which is here. So all of this, okay? Now from there down, that's gonna be the lower respiratory tracts. So we have the trachea with the bronchi and bronchioles. They're like secondary, tertiary, quaternary bronchioles. They go way on down. And uh, then we have the lungs themselves, all right? The lungs themselves are very important. This is where our gas exchange physically takes place, where we get our oxygen and release our carbon dioxide. And then we have the diaphragm, which is a bit of skeletal muscle uh, that when it flexes, it pulls air into the lungs and it relaxes, it allows air back out. Now, the whole idea here is oxygen, <clears throat> let me try again. Oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. We want to gain oxygen and release carbon dioxide. Now, this is all based off of diffusion. It's what we refer to as partial pressures. So where the oxygen isn't, the oxygen wants to go. Uh, where the carbon dioxide is, the, the carbon dioxide wants to leave. So, so it's all diffusion based from high concentration to low concentration. You'll be seeing that as we proceed through. Now, you need to know the pathway of air through the respiratory system. And that pathway is demonstrated here in its absolute completion. You go from the nose, you typically breathe through your nose. This is how the physiology of the human system works. The nose is very important for air conditioning. Not the air conditioning you have in your house, but the conditioning of air. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, the pharynx, pharynxes you might say here, kind of the back of the throat area. The larynx, which is on down here. And we have trachea, bronchi, uh, bronchus, then bronchioles, that would be little bronchi. And then the alveoli, or the little air sacs of the lungs themselves. The alveoli are the actual location where the cardiovascular, uh, the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system are incredibly in close contact. The alveoli are the tiny little air sacs wrapped in capillaries that allow the gases to exchange places. Incredibly important, the alveoli. All right, so uh, the upper respiratory tract, the nose, the nose. So what does the nose do for you? Well, the nose has a lot of hairs in it. The nose has a lot of mucus in it. Uh, basically, this will condition air as it comes into the nasal cavity. It's going to clean the air. It's going to warm the air up. It's going to moisturize it, kind of get it ready for the lungs. One of the main goals, again, as you probably grasp, is to kind of catch that early debris. It really works. Um, and, and again, all the capillaries here, it helps to warm the air up is what I'm shooting for. The pharynx, again, there are three parts. Don't worry about that, but there are, in fact, three parts to this. Uh, we think of this as the throat. This is where your tonsils are going to be located. Tonsils are an early warning system for your lymphatic um, immune responses. So if you consume something potentially pathogenic, the tonsils are like the first stage of warning the body that something bad's coming. Um, those random times when you eat something and almost immediately feel sick and throw up. Perhaps that's tonsillar influence. Uh, yeah, perfect, that'll do. And then, of course, there is the larynx down here. Now, the larynx is incredibly important. It's housed in cartilage, so you can kind of grab your larynx, and it, it'll tighten up and change the volume of your voice and the way it sounds. That's because when you augment the cartilaginous shape of the larynx, it augments the shape of these vocal folds, and these vocal folds are very important for allowing you to process and make sound. I actually have a video of this, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see if I've got it sitting around. Yeah, yeah, here we go. All right, check this out. Um, actually, I have to augment my audio settings. Let's do that. And speakers. And speakers. All right, listen to this. It's pretty crazy. And obviously, it's going to take us to a commercial or something. Yeah, here we go. So this is the vocal folds inside the larynx. This is the epiglottis at the top here. Let me show you. Hang on. So what you have there is the epiglottis. The camera is right there. OK, 
right there. It's aiming down. You can see inside the larynx. You can see the epiglottis sticking up. The epiglottis is a really cool structure. It's um, made out of uh, elastic cartilage. And what it does is it will close off your tracheal passages when you swallow. If you've ever been laying down in a weird position, you drink something, and it, you, you start coughing. <coughs> well, my wife's like, hey, what's the matter? And it's like, oh, it went down the wrong pipe. Literally what happens. Because your esophagus is back here, and your trachea is up here. The trachea should not get any food debris or fluids or anything. All that's supposed to go down the esophagus. And when you swallow, and you can put your finger on your Adam's apple. Yes, you all have an Adam's apple. And you swallow, you'll feel it move up. Okay, what's happening is the larynx is moving up against the epiglottis, covering over the esophagus. No, no, no. Covering over the larynx. Basically shielding the esophagus. Jeez, man, I'm messing this up. Basically shielding the tracheal passages, there we go, from food and fluid and what have you, allowing things to go down the esophagus. There we go. Now, uh, back to it. So the camera's like right in there, right in there. You can see the uh, epiglottis, the structure that closes it off. So there's the epiglottis. So these are your vocal folds. See, she's breathing, changing the shape. This lady's singing changing the shape of these structures to augment the way that they sound. Breathing. See them vibrate? This is amazing stuff. So this is all held in place by cartilage. There's no bone here, per se. You can see the vibration. Pretty neat stuff. Pretty neat stuff, man. All right, and uh, I think that's about it for this upper respiratory tract. So let's move it on. So here we have the lower respiratory tract. Now the lower respiratory tract is very important. The early parts in particular, the tracheal passages matter here because the tracheal passages have a unique lining that helps them to shield you from debris. The tracheal passages, one, are covered in, uh, I say cartilaginous rings, but that's incorrect. Both um, this larynx here and the tracheal passages from there on down, they're all held in place with cartilage. But they're not true rings per se, they look like horseshoes. It's like a little horseshoe and the backing is up against the esophagus. So this is tracheal passages, this is the esophagus. So if you touch your throat, what you're touching is your trachea. And you can feel, like if you kind of go up and down, the rings that are in there, these little horseshoes of cartilage. And then behind that would be the esophagus. When you swallow food, that's going down the esophagus. Um, the, the idea is that it's this membranous area here, so that if you swallow and it's something hard or big, you don't damage the trachea. It's not grinding against the trachea. It's got this membranous area back there. And further, the lining of the tracheal passage itself has cilia and mucus. It's got these goblet cells in there that make mucus, and it's got these, uh, what are called, well, don't worry about what they're called, but they, can, they have cilia. It's a special type of epithelium that has cilia. And what will happen is, as you breathe in, debris gets caught in the mucus produced by the goblet cells in these tracheal passages, and then the cilia push that material up and out of the respiratory tract. Works like a charm. It's an excellent, excellent concept. Uh, then we have the bronchial trees that down here, and there's multiple different variants of this, all terminating in alveoli. All right, the alveoli. Uh, the alveoli have incredibly high surface area, just crazy amounts of surface area internally. That's the whole idea behind them is they are incredibly high in surface area and they are just wrapped up in blood capillaries. So there is the thinnest tissue the body can physically make that makes these alveoli and they are completely enveloped in capillaries. So this is the area where gas exchange occurs is in the alveoli. Now the lungs are called the pleura in the older parlance, pleura, plural. Uh, there are two of them. There are two um, um, lobes to the lungs, a left lobe and a right lung. And the idea is, and you got to think about this, it's actually not like, you got to think about this in an anatomical position, all right? So the left lobe has two, I'm sorry, the left lung has two lobes, one, two. The right lung has three, one, two, three. Uh, the right lung will be a little higher because the liver is below it and the liver pushes up against the, um, the lung here, pushing it up. And then the left, I'm sorry, Keep messing this up, folks. Let me just ignore my picture. The right lung is a little higher because the liver is there to push it up. And then the left lung has a big notch in it because the heart kind of sits up against it. Okay, so that notch there is from the heart. Yeah, perfect. That'll do. 
All right, uh, the control, how we control breathing. So your respiratory control center of your brain is in your medulla oblongata. Uh, now that's important because the medulla oblongata is the brain stem. This is the primitive brain. What that means is you will breathe even if you're not thinking about breathing, which is important. Now, you can use cortical controls to regulate your breathing. You can decide to take a deep breath or not. You can decide to hold your breath for a period of time or not. But you may have like seen a little kid try to hold their breath to get their way. Just let them, because what's going to happen is they're going to pass out, and their medulla oblongata is going to make them start breathing again, because this is a lower brainstem structure. Again, this is very important for even like while we're asleep, the medulla, the medulla oblongata keeps us breathing. We think that, and this is terrible, but it's true, uh, this sudden infant death syndrome, which you probably have heard of, is caused by the medulla oblongata malfunctioning and stopping breathing while a uh, newborn is, is, well, sleeping in essence. All right, and then of course there are chemical controls. Chemical controls. Uh, you have a set of receptors in the brain and a set of receptors down in the cardiovascular system that basically pick up the pH of the blood. If you don't realize this, uh, as the blood's oxygen levels deplete and carbon dioxide levels rise, anytime there's a lot of carbon dioxide in an area, man, it starts getting acidic real fast. So they pick up that the pH is getting very acidic and it triggers a breathing response. Okay, it will cause you to begin to breathe. So if you try to hold your breath for a little while, you'll start really getting the urge to breathe. And that's your brain saying, hey, we're getting a little acidic in the bloodstream. You're getting what's called acidosis. You better breathe fast or we're going to end up with problems. All right, two phases of breathing. That would be uh, inspiration and expiration of ventilation. Inspiration and expiration. Um, what do I want to say here? This is done by your intercostals and your diaphragm. What will happen is... Uh, the diaphragm pulls down like a syringe and the costals cause the ribcage to expand and that augments the air pressure inside the thoracic cavity. You end up with a low pressure situation in the thoracic cavity when this diaphragm pulls down and air is pulled in via the trachea. You can see that quite clearly here. You see the diaphragm kind of pumping. This is what's called a, uh, a, well, it's a special variant of an MRI where they use a magnetic gas. You breathe in a magnetic gas and it allows them to diagnose variations within the lungs. But you can see the pumping of the diaphragm here. That is done to pull air in from the top. All right. Expiration, same concept. You relax the intercostals. You relax the diaphragm and allow air to exit. Now, so let's make sure we're together on this. The diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. Intercostals are between the ribs. The diaphragm is uh, the, the base of the thoracic cavity. So when this thing pulls down, it pulls air in, and when this thing relaxes, it lets air out. Yeah, perfect. That's, that, that's, that'll, that'll work. Uh, and then, of course, worthy of mention here is getting the breath knocked out of you. Uh, what will happen here is you get a shock to what's called your solar plexus. You fall real hard on your back, get hit in the wrong way. And what this does is it sends the diaphragm into a spasm, and the diaphragm's in a spasm. It decreases your capacity for breathing. You become very thankful for your little intercostal muscles inside of there, because the intercostals are the only things that will allow you to breathe during that time. So if you get the breath knocked out of you, you get those little <laughs> short breaths. <laughs> That's intercostals trying to keep you alive until your diaphragm relaxes. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. That'll do just fine. Uh, so, vital capacity and visualizing it. What you see here is a, um, what do you call these? I forget what this is. It's a spirometry chart is what this is. It's a spirometry, spirometry chart. So basically, I have a tool in the lab. You could blow into this thing and breathe in through it, and it'll measure the amount of volume, the amount of air that your lungs are capable of moving. Uh, it's very simple. As you sit and just breathe like normal, you end up with inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. This is called tidal volume. As you sit here listening to me talk about this, you're breathing tidally. Like, think about the tides in the ocean, right? The tides go out, the tides come in. The tides go out, the tides come in. It's a very simple concept. Uh, this is your tidal volume, tidal volume. And then built into this, we have what's referred to as... Uh, inspiratory and expiratory reserve volumes. The uh, inspiratory reserve volume is the maximum amount of air you can breathe in after breathing tidally. So if I'm just sitting here and talking to you and I'm breathing normally, there's still an amount of air that I can breathe in on top of that. If I want to, I can, you know, really take a deep breath and that's my, um, my inspiratory reserve volume. 
by comparison, if I'm just talking to you and doing the things that I do when I'm just normally breathing tidally, I can also really exhale forcefully. And that's my expiratory reserve volume, the maximum amount of air that I can exhale given this circumstance. All right. Uh, the volume of air moving in another body. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how this works. Now, what we're trying to get at is a concept we refer to as your vital capacity. Uh, your vital capacity is, in essence, your um, the maximum amount of air you can exhale after a maximal inspiration. Let me say that again. The maximum amount of volume of air that you can release after you inhale maximally. What we're measuring is all of this. All of this is your vital capacity. And we measure vital capacity to, to check on um, variations in lung diseases. If somebody's having lung issues, we can uh, use a chart and diagnose what your vital capacity should be. And if it's above or below that, it'll tell us something. Okay, it lets us know that there are potentially problems in one place or another. Like, for instance, professional athletes tend to have a very high vital capacity compared to average. Smokers tend to have a very low vital capacity compared to average. And then, of course, the lungs never fully close. They have a surfactant inside of them that keeps them from collapsing. Uh, and this is referred to as a residual volume. It's just the air remaining that you can't physically exhale. So, uh, exchange of gases in the body. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. The exchange of gases is dependent upon diffusion. This is fact. Uh, this is a result of what we call partial pressure. This is the amount of pressure of these gases as they are moving through the system. Oxygen and carbon dioxide will diffuse from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration, or what we might call areas of higher partial pressure to areas of lower partial pressure. This is commonly referred to as external respiration and internal respiration. External respiration is that between the lung alveoli and the blood capillaries. This happens in the lungs. External respiration is called external because it deals with air coming from the outside world. It's external respiration. I'm breathing in from the outside world, and what's happening there is I'm sending blood that's low in oxygen back to my heart. That blood goes into the lungs, and the lungs pull the carbon dioxide out and put carbon dioxide. I'm sorry, and put oxygen in. So uh, there's very little oxygen in the blood that goes to the lungs. So because there's a lot of oxygen in the air around you, you're breathing, and very little in the blood, that blood oxygen, I'm sorry, that oxygen in the air diffuses into the blood. Let me do that again. Um, when you breathe in, you're breathing in oxygen-rich air. The blood in your lungs is low in oxygen. So the oxygen goes from high concentration to low concentration. It goes from the air into the blood. Now, the blood, by comparison, has a lot of carbon dioxide in it when it gets to the lungs. So it moves from high concentration in the blood to low concentration in the air in the alveolar sacs of the lungs. So this is how we exchange gases. It's dealing with what we call partial pressure or really just diffusion, okay? The gases diffuse from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So when blood gets to the lungs, external respiration, you gotta ask yourself, where is the oxygen? It's in the air. Where does it wanna go? It wants to go in the blood. Where is the carbon dioxide? It's in the blood. Where does it want to go? To the air. This is how we exchange gases. In the tissues, what we call internal respiration, like uh, if you're using your muscles and blood's pumping into those muscles to keep them functional, that is internal respiration. This deals with the capillaries around your tissues. And what will happen here is, like that muscle is an oxygen deck. So you've got oxygen-rich blood. It moves oxygen into the tissues. And the tissues use that oxygen and then offload carbon dioxide back into the blood. So the blood comes in with oxygen. The blood leaves with carbon dioxide. That is how internal respiration works. That's how internal respiration works. So you need to be able to tell me about these two. Kind of compare and contrast. All right. Upper respiratory tract infections. Sinusitis, otitis media, tonsillitis, laryngitis. Anything itis, anything itis means inflammation. So sinusitis is simply an inflammation of the sinuses. They get all inflamed and they, they leak out fluid, they get blockages. Otitis media, media, anything oto is sound. So otitis media is a middle ear infection. A uh, kid gets an ear infection, that's typically otitis media. They go and they take a um, otoscope and they look in there and they see the tympanic membrane. I may have shown you this. No, I didn't. <laughs> they look at the, the um, um, tympanic membrane and see if it's inflamed or swollen. That's otitis media. That pressure in there, it hurts. It can cause an infection. It's no fun. Tonsillitis is an inflammation of the tonsils. We tend not to remove the tonsils anymore since we realize they have immune function. We tend to try to treat them. Uh, but in the past, they, they have removed them 
quite often, and they're really weird, this has no bearing, but they're a really weird texture. Like, it's almost like a super ball, like a rubber ball you bounce off the ground. Uh, their texture, if you were to cut one out and accidentally drop it, it would bounce back up to your hand. Like, they're very springy. It's a weird thing. Uh, and then there is laryngitis, an inflammation of the larynx. Um, so you, you hear people come in and they're talking like this because they can't make their vocal cords vibrate because they're all swollen and inflamed. That's laryngitis. Okay, an inflammation of the larynx. It causes you not to be able to speak. Uh, and then there's a number of lower respiratory tract disorders. Pneumonia, fibrosis, tuberculosis, emphysema, asthma, and bronchitis. This is a, you should be pretty freaking familiar with a lot of this already. Like, you know that the pneumonia is when you have uh, mucus or fluid buildup in the lungs. And what this does is it fills some of the alveoli and decreases your lung capacity. So it decreases your capacity to breathe. And then, uh, in worst case scenario, this fluid gets infected. And, boy, that's just bad news. Um... You know, treating deep lung infections is not a fun experience. Pulmonary fibrosis. What can happen here is, uh, in this case, asbestos, but some sort of irritant can get into the lungs and over time cause the lungs to uh, build up fibrous connected tissue externally. And what will happen here is this fibrous connected tissue holds the alveoli and prevents them from expanding. Imagine, like, if I got behind you and I wrap my arms around you and give you a good squeeze and just hold you there, you would have a hard time expanding your lungs. It's, that's what pulmonary fibrosis is like, okay? The alveoli are restrained from expanding fully, so um, you, you can't take deep breaths. There is no taking deep breaths, and it's not a good experience. Uh, tuberculosis. You've all heard of tuberculosis. So uh, what happens with tuberculosis, the bacteria uh, that cause tuberculosis... They get into the uh, alveoli of the lungs, and what, the body's very good at defending you against this. They'll just shield off the, the bacteria that get in there and block them from having any influence whatsoever over the lungs. But because they are there, they decrease your lung capacity. That's area that could have been used for oxygen exchange, so you have decreased lung capacity as a result of this. And further, if you ever get very ill, if you have a major um, uh, immune malfunction, these bacteria can break loose and just wreak havoc on the lungs. So they're in there for good. They stay. Uh, emphysema, this is typical of smokers. What happens here is the, uh, the gases that one would breathe in destroy the walls of the alveoli. So instead of having a bunch of little individual sacs, you just have one big sac. And that really just kills the surface area, makes it terrible. So uh, the gas exchange within the lungs is really decreased. I mean, really decreased. Uh, asthma. So your lungs have um, muscle within them that can close off these airways if they need to. Or by comparison, they can dilate the airways if they need to as well. A person with asthma, for whatever reason, can get an irritant in there and cause muscle spasms in these bronchioles. And that'll shut off the lungs and prevent you from being able to breathe. We have uh, uh, steroid inhalers that, that decrease the chance of this. And then, of course, there's bronchitis. Good old-fashioned itis, bronchitis. Bronchitis is when the bronchioles uh, become inflamed. And when they become inflamed, they swell, they have a lot of mucus, so you're uh, constantly coughing up junk, and it's just a not fun experience. And then, I believe, last but not least, is lung cancer. So in lung cancer, we have uncontrolled cell division in the lungs, oftentimes caused by smoking, and this is oftentimes fatal. Now, I'm going to read to you. I normally try not to read, but th this is all worthy information, so I'm just going to read to you. All forms of tobacco can cause major, major damage. Now, these are old numbers. I haven't updated them this year. Cigarette smoking causes more than 480,000 deaths in a year in the United States. That's one in five people that die, die from smoking. It's crazy. More than ten times as many people in the U.S. died prematurely from cigarette smoking than had died in all wars fought by the United States during its entire history. Smoking causes about 90% or 9 out of 10 of all lung cancer deaths in men and women. We wear those uh, pink ribbons for breast cancer awareness. A terrible idea because more women die from smoking from lung cancer than die from breast cancer. A vastly higher number. So smoking, smoking is the killer here, folks. Smoking is the killer for men and women. Like, it's, man, it's, it's terrible, all right? Smoking increases a person's chance of lung, mouth, larynx, esophageal, bladder, kidney, pancreatic, stomach, and cervical cancer. Smoking also increases the chance of chronic bronchitis, emphysema, heart disease, stillbirths, 
and harm to unborn children. Go and read some of the things that the tobacco industry has said in the past about women that are pregnant smoking if you want to get really ticked off. They say that, oh man, just go and read it. It's terrible. Uh, passive smoke can increase a non-smoker's chance of pneumonia, bronchitis, and lung cancer. So, take home messages. Smoking is estimated to increase the risk of strokes by two to four times. Coronary heart disease by two to four times. Of developing lung cancer by about 25 times. So, try not to smoke. Especially not regularly. You want to stay away from tobacco whenever possible. And uh, I think that's that, folks. That's that. So uh, let's stop it there. That's the respiratory system. And I'll be putting another one up for you pretty soon. Thanks.